Hi guys, this is section 2-5. This is going to be the last section of our chapter before we get to your test coming up at the end of this week. So for this lesson and this video, I did make a handout for you guys and I printed those for the subs. So if you haven't grabbed one of those yet, go ahead and grab it and then you can take notes along with the video. All right, so in section 2-5, we're talking about measures of position, and we're mostly going to be talking about five number summaries, which make what we call box and whisker plots. All right, so when we talk about quartiles, we're talking about splitting data up into four equal subsets. We are going to make a five number summary using five numbers, including our quartiles. So we talked about in an earlier lesson about our minimum and our maximum. And notice I've already got this data example um, ordered for you guys, but you want, want to do that first, of course, before you do anything else. Our minimum and our maximum create our range eventually. So for example, for this data set, we could say that the range of the data set is 27. Then we find the median of the data set. And the median of the data set, again, is a review definition. It's the middle of our data, and if we have two data values in the middle, like we do in this data set, if we have an even number of data values, we find the average of those. So in this data set, our median is 13.5, and we call that the second quartile. So that guy has two names. Then, once we have our median, we have an upper half of our data and a lower half of our data. In this example, we have six data values in the lower half, and six data values in the upper half. We divide each of those in half again by again finding a median. So it's a median of the lower half and that creates our first quartile. We're going to label that Q1 and a median of our upper half and that creates our second, uh, third quartile. So we're going to name that Q3 and those are the last two numbers that are missing in our five number summary. All right, so here's an example. It says each year in the U.S. Um, automobiles, uh, commuters waste fuel due to traffic congestion. The amounts in gallons per year of fuel wasted by commuters in the 14 largest U.S. urban areas are listed. Find the first, second, and third quartiles of the data set. What do we observe? And we'll answer that after we get our quartiles. Now, I've already went ahead and numbered this for you, um, put it in order from least to greatest. So we're going to start by finding our median. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Double checking all my data is there. I've got 14 data values, which means when I split it in half, I'm going to have 7 in the bottom and 7 in the top. So if I'm counting up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right there, double check 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Our median here, which is our Q2, is going to lie between 25 and 25. Therefore, our second quartile, the average of those, is 25. So now we have seven data values in our upper half and seven data values in our lower half. The middle of those will be the fourth value in either direction, leaving three above it and three below it. So my first quartile would be 23, and my third quartile is 29. No need to find an average here because it's the value in the middle. We could also label 11 as my min and 35 as my max, and that gives me my full five number summary if we need it. So now if we wanted to name what we observe, um, we could say that this data is pretty well clustered together. Um, between the first quartile and the third quartile, we don't have a huge difference in our values. Um, so this looks like it is going to be pretty much a normal curve. We look like we've got symmetric data. We don't have too many values on the high end or too many on the low end. But when we talk about what do you observe, that's really, again, up for interpretation like we've talked about in some of our sections before. In the next example, we're going to use technology. So we're going to use our graphing calculator to find quartiles. So here, this data represents tuition costs in thousands of dollars for 13 liberal arts colleges. And again, we're going to name what we observe. 
Um, this data is ordered, but to do this in the calculator, you do not have to have it ordered like um, some of the other things that we've done before. You can type it in any order, and the calculator will just figure it out for you. All right, so same steps here as what we used when we were finding the mean and standard deviation. So we're going to hit Stat, Edit. To clear out a list, you're going to go up to the list name, hit Clear, go back down. Do that for both of them here. If you don't have an L1 and an L2, real quick, hit stat, number five, and enter. That'll set it back up for you again, your defaults here. Um, that happens if you accidentally delete a list rather than clear a list. Okay, so we're just going to put all of our data values in L1. And you can see if I hover over that last number, it says L1 and then parentheses 13. That tells me it's the 13th data value. I know I had 13 liberal arts colleges, so I've got all my numbers. Now to find my quartiles, we're going to hit stat, go over to calc, and then number one, one variable statistics. Just keep hitting enter until you get that output. And we are looking for the stuff at the bottom. There we go. And the graphing calculator really nicely gives you that five number summary. So the minimum you can see is 25, maximum 52, representing 25,000, 52,000. First quartile is 38,000, our median is 47, and our third quartile is 51. Okay, so now let's talk about taking that five number summary and turning it into a box plot. When we turn it into a box plot, we want to make sure that we um, make our number line first. Here we've got some data listed, um, and we don't know what this data stands for, but we'd want to, of course, whatever it stands for, put a label on our table to show what it stands for at the end. So it might be tuition costs, or it might be um, gasoline prices, or whatever. You want to make sure you label that at the bottom. Okay, um, so our number line, we've got it numbered for whatever values we have to graph. To start, we're just going to make a point above our number line at these values, all five of them. So at five, that's my minimum. At nine, that's my first quartile. At 13 and a half, that's my median. At 23, that's my third quartile. And my max is 32. Once you have your five number summary plotted, we're going to take the first and the third quartile and use that as the ends of a rectangle. The median will create a bar going down the middle of your rectangle and then connecting your outermost points you get a whisker. Labeling what percent of the data falls in each part of our box and whisker plot. So we call them quartiles because they divide our data up into four equal parts. Each whisker will have 25% of your data, and each half of your box will contain 25% of your data. A smaller whisker or a smaller section of your box contain 25%, but because we're seeing a smaller area, it means our data is much more condensed. So the lower half of this data is very condensed. We've got a lot of data values within a certain set of numbers. And then when we see larger regions like this upper set of quartiles, a really long whisker or an extended piece of the box, it means our data is more spread out. Finding an inner quartile range. Inner quartile range, or IQR, is defined as our third quartile minus our first quartile. That is going to be, in our box and whisker plot, the width of our rectangle. That's our inner quartile range. So you can label that on this plot, IQR. Okay. 
So here's an example. Um, here we have winning Super Bowl scores between 1967 and 1997. So that's our graph labeled. You can see our number line and we've got our box and whisker right above it. We want to first find the median score. So remember the median is located in the middle of the box. So we're doing our best to approximate what we see here. And I'm going to say that that looks like it's approximately at 30. We're going to identify the range of the plot below. This is not inner quartile range, it is just range. So that is maximum minus minimum. And again, we're approximating the best we can. So it looks like my max is about 55. My min, I'm counting by twos here, so it looks like about 14. Subtract those, and I'm going to get a range of data of about 41. The inner quartile range, Q3 minus Q1. Again, we're going to approximate those. So it looks like my Q3 on the edge of that box there is about 38. Q1 mm, looks like it's partway between 22 and 24, so 23. My IQR, my inner quartile range is 15. Finally, we want to know what percent of the scores fall between 14 and 38. So I'm just going to shade that part of our box and whisker plot. So 14 all the way to 30 and to 38. So that covers three regions of my box and whisker plot. We know each region represents a quartile or 25% of the data. So 75% of the scores were between 14 and 38 based on this graphic. Okay, now why we'd want to use an inner quartile range. We've talked a little bit about outliers so far this semester and we've just to this point decided well if something kind of looks like it's much higher or lower than the data we're going to call it an outlier. Inner quartile range actually allows us to calculate truly if something is an outlier or not. So if you want to calculate an outlier, first step is we're going to find that inner quartile range, Q3 minus Q1. Then we're going to multiply that IQR value by 1.5, and I call that the magic number. We're going to find a lower bound and an upper bound, a high bound, for outliers. And what we're looking for is a set of numbers that would be reasonable for our set of data. So to get that, we're going to take our first quartile and subtract the magic number, our third quartile, and add the magic number. If between those low and high bounds, you have any numbers that are outside of it. So let's say our low and high bounds, let's look at this data here. Maybe my low bound would be a 3, and my upper bound would be a 26. Well, if my upper bound is a 26 and I've got these guys in the stem and leaf plot that are beyond 26, we would then officially rule those as outliers. Okay, so let's look at this data set. Um, here we're going to find quartiles, inner quartile range, and determine if we have any outliers. And um, we're going to go ahead and do this one by hand, but you could use your graphing calculator just as a shortcut if you wanted to. Just remember you won't have that graphing calculator on test day. All right, so my data is ordered for me already. I'm going to go ahead and count up how many data values I have. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So first I want to find my median which means if I have 16 data values, I'm going to have 8 above it and 8 below it. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 8 above it. Um, and that means my median is right between those 60s. No need to find an average here. So my Q2, my middle quartile, my second quartile is 60. Okay. Then I have 8 data values above it, 8 data values below it. So we'll split those again in half, 4 and 4. And that's going to give me my third quartile and my first quartile. Okay, my first quartile is in the middle of 57 and 59, so that gives me 58. My third quartile is right in the middle of 263, so 63. And then if I'm completing my five number summary, I could also label my min and my max. Okay. 
So I found my quartiles. Now I'm going to find my inner quartile range, which is my Q3 minus my Q1. We're going to get 15. Then to find my outliers, I'm going to do 1.5 times my inner quartile range, which is 15. And that's going to give me the magic number that I'm looking for. So 1.5 times 15 gives me 22.5. Okay. From there, we're going to take Q3 and add on 22.5, my magic number. And we're going to take Q1 and subtract 22.5 my magic number. Okay, so Q3 was 63 minus 22.5. That gives me, oh, plus 40. Did that wrong. Here we go. Plus 22.5 gives me 85.5. Q1 minus 22.5, 58 minus 22.5 is going to give me 30, let's see here, 34, no, 35, 0.5, there we go. Okay, so this is my high bound, and this is my low bound. Once we have our high bound and the low bound, we're going to look, do we have any values in this data set that are above the high bound or below the low bound? My highest value was 80. 85.5 80 is above that, so we're good. My lowest value was 51. It is not below 35.5, so we can officially say, although that 80 is pretty big, we have no outliers for this data set. Okay, now we have quartiles that we've talked about. Those are our Q1, Q2, Q3. It divides our data set into four equal parts. Other terms that you're going to see in this section are deciles. So quartiles divide us into four equal parts, deciles into 10 equal parts, and they're going to use a D for those. And then percentiles, what we're going to use most often, that divide into 100 equal parts. To calculate a percentile, you first need to order your data. So we've got a set of ordered data here, which is great. Um, then we're going to figure out how many data values are below a specific value of x. So let's say we want to know what percentile of the data falls um, below number 10, or 10 is what percent um, tile in this data set. So we're going to count up how many numbers fall below 10, and in this case there are 16 numbers that fall below 10 in the data set, out of 20 total, multiply that by 100, or you could just move the decimal space two spaces to the right, and you're going to get 80%. So that tells us the number 10 in this data set is at the 80th percentile, and that means 80% of the data is below 10. So it's important to remember when you are calculating a percentile, you are calculating the percent of the data that is below the specific value you have um, in your data set. Okay? So if we say that someone is in the 99th percentile, that's as high as you can get because 99% of the data or 99% of the other people fall below them. So that means your number 100, if you are in the 99th percentile, 99% are below you, so you're at the top. All right, interpreting percentiles, we've got a quick little graph here. This is an OGIV graph, which remember means a cumulative frequency graph. 
Here we've got this for our SAT scores of college-bound students in a recent year. We want to know what score represents the 80th percentile. Because they've graphed this for, already, um, for us already and we're looking at cumulative frequency, when we find our percentile 80, all we have to do on an OGIF graph is go over to that plotted point and then go down. And we're going to say that's approximately 1350. So that means if your SAT score is a 1350, 80% of other students that took that same SAT scored below you. Finding a percentile. Um, here it says tuition costs and thousands of dollars for 25 liberal arts colleges are listed. We're going to use technology to reorder the list in Google Sheets, then find the percentile that corresponds to 34,000. Um, I don't have my Google Sheets loaded up here. I know we did this already in class before. If you guys want to try it on your Chromebook, this is a great opportunity to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and number them by hand. Um, remember, if you are using Google Sheets, you can just open a new Google Sheet, put all of your data in the first column, highlight your data and then you're going to select data at the top and then you can just sort by range and then it'll reorder everything for you. Okay, so let me make sure I get everybody here. So I'm going to start with 16. Then I've got a couple 18s. Then my next value looks like is a 23. A 25. Seven. Do I have any more twenties? Nope. I've got a thirty-three. Oh, I've got a thirty. Then a thirty-three. Then two thirty-fours. I've got a couple thirty-fives. I've got a thirty-six. 40, 41, nope, I've got another 40, take that back, that's why I cross them out as I go so I don't forget anybody, 41, 44 and 45, 47, 49, 50, And then I got an odd number. There we go, 52. Okay, we are trying to figure out what percentile corresponds to 34,000. So I'm going to find 34,000. I've got a couple of them here. When we calculate percentile, it's the percent of data values that fall below 34,000. So that would be all of the guys between 16 and 33. So I'm just going to count all those up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 divided by my total n in my data set, which here is 25. 8 divided by 25 gives me 0.32. Multiply by 100, or just move that decimal two spaces to the right. The 32nd percentile is worth 34,000 lies. So that means if your tuition cost is 34000 then 32% of other liberal arts colleges are cheaper than yours. Okay, the last part of this lesson talks about a z-score, and we're going to be using this a lot when we get into chapters 5, 6, and 7 coming up later on in the semester. A z-score refers back to our standard deviations that we were talking about in the last section. A z-score is how many standard deviations a certain data value lies from the mean. And a z-score could be positive or negative. If a z-score is positive, it tells me that we are greater than the mean, above the mean. And if a z-score is negative, it tells me that we're below the mean. A z-score of 2, for example, tells me that that data value is two standard deviations to the right of the mean. 
or a z-score of negative 1.5 tells me that that data value is one and a half standard deviations to the left of the mean. How we calculate a z-score is the formula below, um, x, which is a specific data value, a score, we're going to call it, minus our mean divided by the standard deviation. And the mean and standard deviation notation that are given here are for population. We can also give this formula as a sample set just by changing our variables around a little bit. For, so for mean, if it's a sample, we use x bar. And for standard deviation, we use an s. So you may see this formula written both ways. Okay, so example, the mean speed of vehicles along a stretch of highway is 56 miles per hour with a standard deviation of 4 miles per hour. You measure speeds of three cars traveling along the stretch of highway at 62, 47, and 56 miles per hour. Find the z-score that corresponds to each speed, and then we're assuming when we calculate a z-score always that we have um, a bell-shaped curve. It also might say is approximately normally distributed. Normal, um, normally distributed is what we call a bell-shaped curve. Okay, so we're going to do this problem three times. We're each um, car that we've measured starting with 62 miles per hour is going to get its own z-score. And then I'll make a little sketch of a bell curve down here so you can see where these are located at. All right, so to find the z-score for 62 miles per hour, we're going to take our data value, 62, minus the mean we were given is 56, divided by the standard deviation of 4. So 62 minus 56, that gives me 6 over 4, and I get a z-score of 1.5. We're going to repeat it with 47 miles per hour. My z-score will be 47 minus my mean, 56, over 4. 47 minus 56 gives me negative 9 over 4. That gives me negative 2.25. And then last but not least, 56 miles per hour. My z-score is going to be 56 minus 56 over 4, which is going to give me a z-score of 0. And that tells me that that is going to be located exactly where my mean is located, because they are the same number. All right, so here is my standard curve, my normal curve, or my bell-shaped curve. We saw this picture in the last section. Your mean is right in the middle, my x bar. And then you're going to be, in this picture, three standard deviations to the right, three to the left. This picture went with our empirical rule in the last section, where 68% of the data was within one standard deviation, 95 was within two, and 99.7 was within three. If I wanted to sketch where these scores were located in my curve, 1.5, see if I can color code this, there we go, would be there. We've got one standard deviation on my first line, two standard deviations on my second line. So 1.5 standard deviations is there, and that would be where 62 miles per hour is located. Then we have negative 2.25, so here's my mean. This is negative one standard deviation. This is negative two standard deviation. So negative two and a quarter is gonna be there. And so that's where 47 miles per hour would be located in this graph. And then finally, 56 miles per hour was my mean. That's where my zero standard deviations is located. And I can go ahead and graph that there. So this is a nice way to tell when you've got a graphed set of data where each specific data value would lie in that normal curve. Okay, comparing z-scores. Here the table below shows the mean scores and standard deviations for a population of men and women. And because it's population, we're using those symbols instead of our x-bar and our s. We're just going to compare the z-scores for a six-foot-tall man versus a six-foot-tall woman. So let's start with a man. Okay, So six-foot-tall, everything's in inches here. 
And if you needed to, you could do 6 times 12, 72 inches. All right, so a 6 foot tall male, 72 inches, minus the mean for men divided by the standard deviation for men. You can use your calculator. 72 minus 69.9 divided by 3 and we're going to get 0.7 is that z-score for a woman. Again, we're looking for the z-score for 72 inches but here my mean is 64.3 and my standard deviation is 2.6. 2.96. So let's think about that normal curve, that bell-shaped curve. There's my mean. I'm going to use my population symbols again. One standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. The men are going to be located right there in my curve. So if you're a six foot tall male, that's where you would be located in the curve of all male heights. If you are a six foot tall woman, you're going to be located at 2.96. So if we were comparing those z-scores, this information tells us that it is significantly more unlikely for a woman to be six foot tall than a men, man to be six foot tall. Um, it's considered much more normal to have a six foot tall male versus um, women at that height are going to be significantly further from our mean. They're going to be multiple standard deviations to the right. Okay. And that is the end of section 2.5. Um, this Math Excel is going to be due tomorrow night. Tomorrow in class, we're going to talk about your first project, which you can take a little sneak peek if you want in Polaris at that. And then you will have time to work on Math Excel during class tomorrow. And of course, ask me questions on any lesson that we've done so far. Thanks, guys.